Okay, as I said, we will now talk about this option A, analog approach. And I will give you an example for this approach. And this example is for a specific site. For a specific site, and this site, to make a disclaimer, the site considered does not refer to a site where the waste disposal facility is planned. However, the data have been taken from studies to explore the possible feasibility of a waste disposal facility at this location. However, due to some political reasons, the activities to study the site terminated in the early 2000s. But nevertheless, I think the, the key elements of this analog approach can be illustrated quite well. Sorry, I have a problem with it. I cannot go to the next slide. Ah, okay, now. Okay. Okay, uh, about the general char characteristics of this area. The site is located in northern Germany. The distance to the sea is about 100 kilometer. And for estimating possible impacts, a region is considered in the vicinity with an area of about 100 square kilometers, this means 10 by 10 kilometers. The altitude above sea level is about 20 meters, and its topography is flat with some little hills. The soil types we have Clay soils, organic soils, uh, which, which developed on rocks and which were dried out. And the height of the water table here is about three to 10 meters. And usually also in current days, sea soils require irrigation. Most important is, which are wind-borne sandy soils, from uh, erosion of material and also due to the sandy seas require irrigation. Clay soils, which have a higher water storage capacity, don't need irrigation. And these clay soils on the other side, if you look at the height of the water table, uh, they have a very high water table so they can get water Plants can get water from, from groundwater directly. The present climate, I mean, there's a reference station which is called this Magdeburg. This is in the middle of Germany. It's a temperate climate. We have relatively cool summers and mild winters. The mean annual temperature is about 9 degrees Celsius, and precipitation is 520 millimeters per year, which is more of the drier areas of Germany. I mean, this is a, I know you live in Japan, and I, but nevertheless, I present you this example from Germany because I hope it can illustrate well, well the ideas behind this analog approach. So what you have seen here is you have to make an assessment for the geological disposal facility, and we look on the interface on the between uh, we look on the biosphere and we don't deal with the rest of the system. 
we have already seen this this uh, just to remember this graph it shows you the path from radiant lights in the waste disposal via the near the groundwater to the well or to the scenario rising groundwater. This is just a reminder what we are talking about, pathway of for withdrawal from water from a well and for rising groundwater. And this was for current situations, for current conditions. However, as we know, we have to make the assessment for the far future. We don't know what the exact environmental conditions in the far future may be. So on the above, again, we have the waste repository, the site and the interface from the biosphere via the well, high water table or surface water. However, we have now also to look not only for the temperate climate on the left side, which is a, which reflects the current situation, but we will also look for a, a range of, of climates, which is, for example, which is colder and more humid, which is colder and, and but drier, which is warmer and more humid and warmer and more dry. And we will also discuss some issues related to the soil, to agricultural practice, to climate and the interface to the biosphere. And we will also look at the habits of the reverence persons. And by the end of the day, we will have represented in this red box a number of results for different climates, for different soil concentrations, which gives us an envelope of uh, which should cover also the future conditions. Okay, we have a number of transfer processes involved. This is here. I think I have shown this already. This is an, a reminder. Irrigation, soil, plant, translocation, deep soil, erosion. The same for the groundwater model, for the rising groundwater model. So we have two scenarios: the well scenario and the rising groundwater scenario. Here you see a compilation of processes, and the processes uh, get a tick if they are relevant for the rising groundwater part, for the well scenario or for the rising groundwater scenario. So most processes are relevant in both cases. However, weathering or interception by plants, irrigation of irrigation water or translocation is not relevant for the rising groundwater, because then this irrigation part doesn't play a role. Here we see the dependency of processes. This again, these are all processes, and I have marked only the, those processes which are driven by or influenced by climate or soil in red. So we have to look in particular now to these processes. Uh, if we look at, we want to answer the question, what might be the impact of climate or future soil conditions? And of course, this is the amount of irrigation water, the rain applied uptake from soil, and the contamination due to resuspension. With regard to uh, loss of soil, migration and erosion are also influenced by climate conditions and by soil conditions. And so is the contamination of air by resuspension. 
and the condemnation and also the living habits, food and water intake is to some extent influenced by climate. What you also see here, there are some universal processes, but we don't expect that such processes will be very different in the future. However, they might to some extent also be influenced by conditions at the site. So the key element is climate and irrigation. What you see here is, uh, this is for, for, for Middle Europe, both the temperature and the carbon dioxide concentration in the air in the last 400,000 years. You see pretty high variations of temperatures, which seems to follow the concentration of carbon dioxide. But the most important thing here is, when you look 400,000 years back, you see there's a variation in temperature, in annual temperature, let's say, of, of plus 4, to minus 8, minus 9 degrees Celsius. So there's a delta a variation of 12 degrees Kelvin. And you see very well the warm areas and the ice ages. So we had in the last four relevant glaciations. But this is important to know, and it's also important to know that we look at this 12 degree Kelvin, this is a variation between cold periods and warm periods. So this comes to the question, how can we identify locations in Europe that reflect the variations of climate in the last 400,000 years? The red side, Magdeburg, is temperate, is current. This is the site we are looking at. And then we have selected a number of five sites which represent other climates. And if you start from the very north, this is North Norway, polar climate, really cold. The mean temperature is 1.6 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, and the precipitation about 500 millimeters per year. And on the other side, if you go to the very south, this is in Marrakesh, this is in Morocco, mean, uh, the mean uh, temperature is about 20 degrees Celsius, very dry, it's only 240 millimeters per year precipitation. And the others are somewhere in between. I, don't want to go into much details here, but it's important to see that the variation of the mean temperature is ranges from 0.6 to 20 Kelvin, so it's about 18 degrees Kelvin. And the range, the range in this light was 12 Kelvin. And what you see here also in the last uh, 400,000 years, I mean, this minus eight, you see the lowest temperature is minus eight degrees Celsius. This is very, very cold. And under such conditions, life is extremely, extremely different, if at all possible, because not, nothing grows and so. And the, the message is that we reflect quite well this variation of 12 degrees Celsius Kelvin with the selection of our five analog sites. So the idea is now that if you look at these five sites, we will also cover possible future 
variations. Here is also again the climate and the scenario considers as uh, the scenarios considered. The red one is a current site, so it's also the site you look at that, and the blue are these analog sites, which represent an, an envelope for future developments. Uh, we assume the world scenarios for all sites, but the rising ground borders we assume also only for uh, for the site we look at for for, for Magdeburg and for Rostow for the colder areas for Rostow for Yoko and Vado, but not for the hot climates. Here you see the monthly, the average monthly temperatures at the site in red and the analog sites. So you see also here, this Magdeburg is very well in the middle of this, this range. And this is what we try to achieve. The precipitation is a bit more uh, variable. You don't see a clear trend, but you see a better trend with the monthly relative humidity at the site and the analog sites. Also here, Magdeburg is about in the middle of this range. So the irrigation. As I said, this is a key processes for rainoclides entering the biosphere and depends on soil and climatic conditions. It means the soil conditions play also some role uh, because of the storage water, of the water storage capacity of soils, which declines in the order of clay, loam and sand. And sand has the lowest water storage capacity, clay is the highest, but in clay it's very strongly bound. Loam provides the best conditions for water storage. However, more important is the relation between temperature, precipitation, and relative humidity. Because by the end of the day, they largely determine the water deficit of a site. And of course, with increasing temperature, more water is lost by evaporation and transpiration of the plants. So we need more irrigation. And the other side with increasing relative humidity, evapotranspiration, and subsequently the water deficit decreases. And if we apply this, I have there's an equation described in this report I have shown in the very beginning. There's an equation which determines based on this climatic conditions, climatic parameters, the water deficit. And here you see a graph. The water deficit, uh, the annual precipitation, and the mean annual temperature. And the water deficit is highest in Marrakesh, this is the steppe, the hottest site we have looked at, and it, it decreases continuously from Rome if you go further north, because temperatures go down. And in Marrakesh, for land growth all around the vegetation period, there's a water deficit of 1500 millimeters, and in the north, there's no water deficit. So you see here a very <coughs> I'm sorry, a very clear dependency of the water deficit in the climate. And this is important to remind. And this is a irrigation machine. 
Yes, the values are lower since the water deficit. Because the water deficit is for the whole period of the vegetation. But the real irrigation needs are a bit less because crops are grown only in a specific part of the vegetation period. For example, in Morocco, they grow some tomatoes and potatoes and things like that. But this is because it's so hot in summer, it is done in the beginning of the vegetation period, January, February, March. But in, there's no potatoes, for example, in June or July, because it's too hot. So here in Marrakesh, general irrigation is about 300 to 700 millimeters, depending on the crop. Okay, let's go to some aspects of long-term behavior of radionuclides in soil. I mean, a key element here, a key question is speciation and the mobility of radionuclides in soil. And in particular, because we have here some elements which are have a very pronounced speciation. I will come to this a bit later. But if you look at the factors which are related or which control mobility in soil, we have, first of all, the sorption capacity determined by clay, silt, and sand and organic matter. The pH value as may have a strong influence on speciation, as well as a redox potential, which quantifies the oxygen status in soils. Of course, when we have agriculture, when we cultivate crops, we have to be aware that soil management aims to achieve favorable conditions for plant growth. And these are the following conditions. It's about to have some organic matter of a few percent at least. To have a pH between 5.5 and 7.5 or 5.0, depending on soil and on, on, on the crop. To have also a positive redox potential between 600, between 100 and 600 millivolts. That you have a good aeration of the soil. Of course, this does not apply for rice. But something that uh, measures are taken to optimize the water supply, that to enable soil aeration, soil aeration and to provide nutrients. This is always a universal goal of agriculture to try to achieve such conditions. This is not always possible, but farmers try to do that. And here you see a relationship between the redox potential, the pH and the salt water. And these are key factors for the radionuclide availability in soil. In this, uh, um, I mean, this graph, you see the pH on the x-axis and the redox potential EH in, in volts. And the gray area represents this area where you have, these are the limits, so to say, for uh, successful agriculture. If you are beyond, beyond these limits, plant growth is very much reduced and it's very difficult and it's not sustainable. Of course, again, rice is an exception because rice goes on waterlogged soils. And the dashed line is a limit for microorganisms in soil. So you see, I mean, this illustrates that growth in agriculture, you have to, uh, only happens within certain limits. And if you look at the chemical reactions and dependence on redox potential, 
well aerated soils. Uh, uh, you have already a uh, redox potential of about 500 already nitrate is produced and we have also a reduction of fe3 plus in wet soils where oxygen is not detectable we have about a redox value of, of 330 millivolts at 200 millivolts nitrate is no longer detectable and in waterlogged soils, you have a reduction of sulfate and a reduction of sulfite, sulfate, sulfite, sulfite, sorry. And we, we have also production, a uh, start of methane production. I mean, it's just to uh, If you look at the absorption of inorganic soil components, I mean, we have seen clay, silt, and sand have a higher uh, absorption capacity, but a little dependent on the pH. In the temperate zones, with the long soils, with where we have relatively long soils, which is about 10,000 years, <coughs> and this is because 10,000 years before we had an ice age. And therefore, the soils are young, and the degree of weathering the mineral, minerals is still low. The minerals are negatively charged, and therefore we have absorption of, of cations. The situation is different in tropical soils. These soils are very old. Uh, they develop since about a million of years or more. And there we can see a very extensive measuring of clay minerals. All the silicates are gone. Most of the silicates are gone. And the remainder is are the positively charged aluminium and iron oxides, which remained. They are positively charged. So this means the cation exchange capacity is very low. We have absorption of anions. We can, it, we can uh, observe this very well because in tropical, deeply weathered soils, the availability of cesium is very high because cesium is positively charged and uh, is then therefore no longer charged in these tropical soils. And uptake of cesium from tropical soils can be very high. So these are processes we have to have at least in mind when we look at longer time frames. The organic matter. This is also a key component in soils. It has a very important function regarding the storage of water and maybe also very important the loosening of soils to improve aeration, to have enough porosity in soil and also for absorption of nutrients. Organic matter is, uh, is uh, the product of the composition of plants and animal material, it is very heterogeneous. There are humus, humus substances and humid acids, and these are very persistent organic compounds with very high molecular weight. Vulvic acids, these are more mobile compounds. They are, have a lower, a relatively low molecular weight and important they also act as complexing agents in soil so they are able to mobilize also uh, some radionuclides for example as plutonium and the absorption to cations of these carboxyl groups which you see on the right side uh, 
strength of this acid is comparable to acetic acids, and of course, absorption decreases with pH. So let's now look to the speciation of of some important radionuclides uh, in soil. This is uranium. If you look at this figure, you see uranium occurs in a in four different species. However, most most important or most available is uranium six plus, which is complex by carbonates, and this is represented by this red arrow. All the other uranium forms are less available. The next question, the next example is iodine. There we have uh, iodine also undergoes a very pronounced uh, speciation. And the most available part is iodide. iodide. And iodide is mainly present in a, in a wide range of soil, but in, in, under wet conditions. Under normal conditions, it is, uh, it is oxidized to Iodide, 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 sorry for that. And another point is selenium. There's a radio guide selenium 679. And also, as you see, a very pronounced speciation. We have here six, seven, eight forms of selenium. The selenium species with the highest uh, with the highest availability, selenate, selenate six plus, and uh, this this area or this region where it's uh, available or where selenium selenate is present is marked by this red arrow. And for selenium, the point is selenium. The point is that selenate is very mobile, very much available. If you go one one step down, we have selenite. The availability of that is much less, and of selenite, even more is even lower. So we can see there's an interaction of climate and availability in soil. And from these figures, you can extract that selenium-79, technetium-99, uranium, neptunium-237 are most available in dry, well aerated soils. It means for warmer climates, bioavailability tends to increase. Iodine 129 is most available in wet organic soils. And for warmer climates, bioavailability tends to decrease. Chlorine is mostly, uh, occurs mostly at chloride, and this is available over a wide range of, of conditions. I mean, all, many of, I mean, all of this. Radioclides, iodide, chloride, selenate, they are N anions. Selenate, technetium pyrotechnitate, they are uh, anions. It means they are negatively charged. No, they are negatively charged, and therefore they are not sorbed by clay minerals. And that's why, if they are present, they are very mobile and so on. So, what are the implications of these considerations for long-term safety assessments? If we look first on this scenario, 
withdrawal of water from a well, and irrigation of crops. I mean, the first thing is irrigation of soil with a of soils with a redox potential, which is resistance yield, which is lower than 100 millivolts, is very unlikely because the soils are wet anyway. Because they are either waterlogged or they have severe structural problems uh, which, which avoid drainage of water. And we have also seen the optimal redox potential for plant growth is near the maximum that can be achieved under normal atmospheric conditions. And of course, I mean, this means the farmer tries to achieve conditions with a high redox potential. But then the plant grows this best, step rise. And this is a universal finding, and this is also valid for future conditions. If you look to the next scenario, this is a contamination of soil due to rising groundwater. And this scenario tends to coincide with wet or waterlogged soils. And the bioavailability of selenium, technetium, uranium, and neptunium is lower than under dry conditions. However, under source conditions, iron 129 may be more available. We have seen in one of the last presentations that the transfer factors soil plants are quant uh, no that the root uptake of radionuclides are quantified by the transfer factor soil plant. And here you see all the uh, transfer factors on the left side for number of plants. And on the right side, you see the half-life in soils for both arable land and pasture. And I have marked some elements in some radiant lights in red, which usually are most important uh, for, for waste disposal uh, considerations. I think this is just an idea. Uh, I will not go into detail because this is too much to explain, but it's just to give you an idea about these transfer factors. The next thing is uh, we have talked about the influence of speciation on mobility in soil of availability in soil. We have started from the temperate area. And we have looked for a number of other areas, like the steppe, Mediterranean area, hot climates, or boreal climates, I mean, colder climates. So since we don't have the data for all these climates, but different climatic conditions, what we did is we introduced modification factors. And this modification factors means it modifies the transfer factor for temperate climate in a specific climate. To give an example, if you look and if you look at selenium 79 for the scenario well and rising and for the scenario well, there is for, for steppe, we have a modification of, of 10. It means it is assumed that the transfer factor for selenium to plants in steppe is a factor of 10 higher 
than in the temperate, in the temperate climate. And for technetium, it's a factor of 10 higher. For neptunium, it's a factor of 5 higher. So these are the differences. And I have marked here only those examples <coughs> where we have a modification factor of 5 or more, or, or less. Because for example, for technetium, in boreal climate, where we have then wet conditions, the transfer factor is a factor of 10 lower. Or if you look at cesium, the transfer factor in boreal climate is a factor of 50 higher. Why? In boreal climates, we have an open accumulation of organic matter, soils are more acid, uh, and under those conditions, uh, Availability of cesium is higher. So, so what you have seen is we start from present age, present situations, and modify, and introduce modification factors to reflect future conditions. So, if you have any question with that. Uh, the question here, 38, this is one, no, 38, this is 38, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, they're not completely from TRS 472, but similar. They were, they are given in this report which is specified in the beginning. And these numbers, they have been a bit more rounded. And as you see, we have only either one, one E minus two, two E minus two, one, two, and five. No, 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 not really. We only give one significant number. And this is because the idea is that the inherent uncertainties is, is too high to allow more significant numbers. So they are similar, but not, not the same. Any other questions to this? I don't hear anything, so I continue. And let's go with the erosion. We already addressed erosion a bit. Uh, I want to stress it a bit more because it is a long term process which should be taken into account because it causes a long term degradation and also a formation of soil. Erosion is not necessary important under all circumstances, but if you look at long, long periods of time, it should not be forgotten. Uh, I think we have erosion by water, and this is first, you have two effects. The energy of drops destroys the soil, aggregates, and soil will, transport, will be transported downhill. And of course, in fact, there's increasing erosion of precipitation, the slope, poor vegetation, and the low content of clay and organic matter because they water. And it might be quite relevant. Some areas you may have a loss of erosion by up to 200 tons per hectare. Here I show you some examples of erosion to illustrate the relevance. This is very quick. This is a rain splash and this is a bigger. Also the erosion due to overgrazing because then the vegetation cover is less. And 
two very famous examples, the Yellow River, and it's called Yellow River because uh, it transports soil material from China's less areas. This is erosion to wind, uh, example from Germany. But you see it's to wind or to rain. And we have to be aware that wind, wind erosion or erosion in general is not a continuous process. And this means the annual loss of soil will vary widely. And the loss within 10 or 20 years or 30 years may be caused by one event where you have a constant uh, combination of strong wind, dry soil, and little vegetation cover. So another wind erosion, this is in Texas, dry area, or in West Africa, where you see how material is blown uh, from the Sahara over to the East Atlantic. So you see it is a process which may be relevant. And there's also an example from China where all this thing what you see here is a uh, less which was formed by the sediment by the sedimentation of eroded material. So it is a global or it's a it's a universe, a global process. Depends in how far it is relevant for society you consider, but it should be taken into account. I already said that erosion is not continuous. And water erosion increases with rainfall intensity and total amount of rainfall and increasing slope. Quite obvious, you can see it nearly every day if you go out. And wind erosion increases with increasing wind speed and with decreasing and with decreasing soil moisture. And fewer events of strong winds or heavy showers may cause most of the erosion. And here's a, a, a comparison, comparing or illustrating the relevance of erosion. So this is the relevance of soil for long-term activity concentration in soil. And the blue curve is the activity in, in the soil uh, or irrigation period of thousand years. And the other, uh, this is a brown and the gray curve includes on top of that some erosion of 10 tons per hectare or 50 tons per hectare. This is only an example. It has to be taken into account when you look at the site to consider. <coughs> So the implication of erosion for long-term safety assessments are wind and water erosion will cause removal of soil and of radionuclides bound to soil. And erosion will cause a wider distribution of radionuclides that have been applied with irrigation water. And as shown as in the last slide, erosion will reduce the maximum radionuclide concentration in soil. So the migration of radionuclides in soil is also an important, an important long-term process. The transport of radionuclides in soil is driven by the water movement in soil, absorption and desorption processes. Uh, and usually migration is derived from absorption coefficient KD and the KD is used in the key quantity in this equation given where is the lambda in soil 
uh, depends on the water velocity in the soil, thickness of the considered soil layer, the soil density, and the KT. So this and the KT describes the relation of the radial lights against the water. And having this in mind, looking at uh, KDs, many KDs for cesium and iodine or for plutonium are very high. So this causes relatively slow migration rates in soil. However, the KD approach is not the whole part of the story. Because KD does not include the migration of radionuclides which are attached to fine soil particles. And here, the relevant components are clay minerals, Fe, aluminium, and silicates, silicium oxides. And if you look at this, at this uh, horizon of this soil horizon from the last, you see where indicated by the red arrow. And this red arrow indicates an accumulation of clay particles. So on the long term, at least in some in some salts, you have a depletion of clay in the upper part and an accumulation of clay in the lower part. And in the long term, this causes a relevant migration of radionuclides from the upper part to the lower part. Of course, it's a long-term process. It's not really relevant if you look at 10 years or 50 years, but it's important if you look at 100, 1,000 or 10,000 years. Here you see a graph with measured migration rates in soil. These measurements, these activities have been done uh, in Germany in the 90s. On the left side, on the left axis, you see the migration velocity in centimeters per year. And on the right side, it's the half-life in the upper 25 centimeters of soil layer. And what you see here is that um, the, the half-life in the upper 25 centimeter soil is in a relatively low range. It covers maybe two orders of magnitude, which is not so much because the variation of the KD values much larger for these elements, the KD vision the variation of KT values for these elements is much larger than the measured migration rates. And this is because uh, KT values is only the ratio between sorbed and desorbed soil and rate of light, whereas uh, and whereas in reality the migration on the long term on, of radioactive lights attached to fine particles is also a relevant process. And surprisingly also for, for radioactive lights, which have very high KD uh, values, like plutonium, migration rate in soil is relatively, or the half-life in the upper 25 centimeters is relatively low. Okay. So, for here again, we have uh, to consider some modification with different climates. First, is for erosion, secondly is for migration. If you look at the temperate climate for erosion, the half-life of radioactive in soil due to erosion 
it's over five centimeters. An estimation, it's something about 1400 years. So on the long term, it is not a, it is not really a, a very effect, a very effective process. I mean, at least not if you look at a broader range. However, in the Mediterranean area, erosion is higher, in particular wind erosion. Uh, it's a factor of four higher, and in Steppe we have assumed it's a factor of ten higher because soils are dry. Long, uh, long periods during the year, but there's no difference in, in the boreal tundra climate. In the migration, we have also here you see now a, a, a migration factor. The, this is a relative value, so for the temperate climate, migration is one. But for Mediterranean steppe, it's less. For Mediterranean, it's about a factor of two, two lower, and for steppe, it's a factor of five lower, because the water flux, which also drives the migration of, of fine particles, is less. So we have we have here a higher, migra a higher erosion rate, but a lower migration rate. But this, to some extent, compensates a little bit. The same is for, for boreal. Where we have migration is also lower because many soils are. Uh, so, so, so water, the water. The water table is pretty high. Is there any question to this? Okay. Uh, the last step in that is the food intake rate. And we have seen that, I mean, food intake varies widely from country to country, from region to region, from continent to continent. You all know this when you travel to Europe or if we travel to Japan, it's different. Of course, we don't know, we cannot know what people eat. However, to explore the range of food diets, at least for the sites we have considered here, we have looked for diets in different countries of Europe, which should reflect this. For example, for Germany, okay, we have for, for, for the well, for the temperate area, we have, we have look, mean German food diets, of course. For Mediterranean, we have looked for a Spanish diet, for the well, we have looked at a Greece diet, very hot, very dry climate. For the boreal, on the ground world, for the well and ground world, we have looked for the Swedish diet. And for the well and, and, and to the tundra, we have looked for the Kola Peninsula. This is only gives only an indication, it gives an idea what the range of diets might be. At the end of the day, we don't know. However, it gives us, uh, it's an indicator, not more. And such consideration can be expanded if you look at more diets, at more, uh, let's say also to more extreme diets. You could also look at diets with only plants with a vegetarian diet or vegan diet. On the other side, you could have a diet with more animal food products, etc. I mean, this is something one has to play with it a little bit to, to find an envelope. And the, the numbers in, in, in blue. <coughs> 
this is where we have really uh, big differences from the other, uh, already big difference from other diets. And there are some boxes with a dash. And in this case, the water is used only as drinking water for humans and animals, not for irrigation. So now if you look at the well scenario, what we have done here is, uh, is to calculate the annual doses normalized to the original guide concentration in water for a range of radionuclides and for different sites. Northern Germany, this is our site we look at, and the blue ones are all the reference sites. And we call it biosphere dose conversion factor. And it means it gives the dose in sievert per year per becquerel per cubic meter, just for comparison reasons. I mean, in general, what you can see is that the values increase with increasing amount irrigation water. And this is obvious because if you have more irrigation water, the rate of input to the system is higher and therefore you would also expect uh, higher values. However, this is uh, not always the case. We see also a little impact of climate for, for tin 126, radium 226, Thorium 230, Productinium 234, etc., where you see very little difference, or relatively little difference between the different sites. Whereas you see a lot of difference for selenium or for chlorine and for technetium. And these differences for technetium and selenium, this is due to the higher availability of technetium and selenium in soils under dry conditions. And we have a higher root uptake, we have a lower migration rate, we have a slightly higher erosion rate. And this, by the end of the day, leads that in these cases, uh, for the dry areas, doses, normalized doses due to uh, selenium and tinnitium are highest. Uh, variation for the elements which are on the right side, radium, productinium, etc. Uh, this gives the contribution of drinking water to the normalized exposure. Uh, I mean, drinking more, the amount of drinking water varies with the climate, but nevertheless, there are some constraints. Usually, the recommendation is that people drink two liters of water, many people drink less. And so we have here assumed two liters of, of drinking water for temperate and cold climates and three liters for temperate climate, for, for hot climates. And you see on this on these elements on the right side, drinking water is often a dominating intake or at least 30. 40% of the intake is caused by drinking water. This means uh, and this, because drinking water is, has a constraint, the variation of, uh, of, the, of the normalized exposure is low because a large part or a relatively large part 
is dominated by, is caused by drinking water, which doesn't vary so much. The other is, if you look at selenium, there is a site where drinking water is not relevant, probably Rome and Marrakesh, but where it's important as Turku on, and Vado in the north, where we don't have irrigation. The same you see for technetium. <coughs> So we have a dominating contribution of drinking water for many radio sites, in particular for colder climates. And this uh, importance of drinking water is also important when we look at the, uh, the overall results, because drinking water, this is something which everyone has to do, and everyone in similar amounts. So this is as some, this reduces the overall variability of the results. Here we have the same for the rising groundwater. These are the, again, the normalized doses in sievert per year per becquerel per cubic meter for the radioglides, uh, assuming rising groundwater, but not non irrigation. Interestingly, here we have the highest impact for cesium 137. No, not cesium 137, I'm sorry. This is 135. For iodine 129 and cesium. 135. And this is because, if you remember, when we had modification factors for iron and cesium, for boreal and for tundra climate, we have seen that under those environmental conditions, the iodine uh, and cesium uptake is much higher. And this is now here reflected in this graph for cesium. And, 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 and iodine 129. Again, for all the elements on the right side, there are little differences between the different sites. As I already said, we have not looked at the rising groundwater scenario for the very hot and dry climates. Okay, now I come already to the summary. So, we have seen environmental conditions will have changed when radiant lights from a waste repository may enter the biosphere. A simple extrapolation of current situations to the far future is not advisable because there is an inherently, such, such simple extrapolations are inherently uncertain and quite speculative. That's why we have used here this analog approach. We have selected a range of sites that define an envelope for future exposure conditions. And the site should represent different climates and agricultural conditions. We have also seen that long-term processes may cause relevant spreading of radioglides in the environment in particular, important long-term processes are migration of radial glides in soil and, to some extent, erosion with wind and water. We have given results now in dose per unit radial glide in water. In general, we found that potential exposures are higher for hot, dry climates. For redox sensitive radio glides as selenium 79, magnesium 79, iodine 20, 129, and neptunium 237, there are pronounced differences between climates. 
We have also seen ingestion is by far the dominating pathway. I have not addressed in this presentation external exposure and inhalation. You can read it in this report, which has been shown in the very beginning. But ingestion is by far the dominating pathway. And more on that, for many uh, regional flights, the intake of drinking water dominates. And this uh, causes that, at least for some regional flights, the differences between climates are relatively low and also surprisingly low. So, thank you very much for this.